Hist 3710. Nazism, Stalinism, and the rise of the total state. This is week nine, and the lecture is on science. And what I want to do here is, uh, with this theme is pretty much what I've done with the other themes, that is to give you a broad comparison, first of the, the theme uh, in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, and then uh, to give you a sense of the relationship between scientists and the state under totalitarian regimes, and then we'll set this theme, science, in a broader European context. So I'll do again what I've done with uh, uh, many of the others and, and start with the totalitarian model, the, the approach that was taken back in the 1950s. And we'll ask, what did Friedrich and Brzezinski have to say about the state and the scientist under totalitarianism? As you might expect, they are quick to emphasize the high degree of control the state exerted over science and scientists. They observed that all institutions of higher learning and all research institutions were absorbed by these states, the Nazi and Soviet states, shortly after they took power. The heads of these institutions, that is teaching and research institutions, were almost invariably political appointees, generally members of the ruling party, that is the Communist or Nazi party. And these political appointees watched over the work of their institutions to ensure that it was all being done in a way that was compatible with party ideology. The academic faculty were selected and promoted for ideological as well as scientific qualifications. And that was even more true for the students that they trained. So, for example, all non-Aryans were removed from state institutions in Nazi Germany, uh, which included leading uh, Jewish scientists like Albert Einstein. And in the Soviet Union, bourgeois scientists that is, those of the wrong family backgrounds, those with pre-revolutionary or foreign qualifications, were subject to very serious harassment, particularly in the late 1920s and the early 1930s, and sometimes subject to arrest and exile. So there's a profound politicization of educational and research institutions. So the scientist became a state official in a situation in which the state defined the truth and the state defined the research agenda. So the direction of research tended to serve the state's interests and the state stopped any research that produced results incompatible with ideological preconceptions. Meanwhile, the state heavily funded research that served political interests. That is, for example, race hygiene in Nazi Germany. And it starved other fields in which it saw no interest. That is to say, for example, genetics in the USSR. And that's something we'll, we'll understand why when we go through that material in one of the seminars. So both the Nazis and the Soviet regime suspended foreign contacts of their scientists, thus limiting the exchange of ideas across national boundaries. Um, and leaders, especially Stalin, occasionally interfered in academic matters, making statements that became an unquestionable orthodoxy in a given field. So, for example, Stalin uh, decided to make a grand statement, strangely, on linguistics in the late 1940s. Now, all of this is to say that according to Friedrich and Brzezinski, the state 
interfered in the work of scientific institutions. Science was made to serve the regime and frequently to the detriment of the science itself. So how could, Bridget and Brzezinski asked, how could uh, good scientific research be unfree? And here Friedrich and Brzezinski under, uh, recognized a certain ambivalence in the attitudes of these two regimes. That is to say, the regimes understood that they couldn't entirely control science without destroying it. And yet, they couldn't, Friedrich and Brzezinski explained, entirely what this meant. So just how unfree or free was Nazi and Soviet science? How did the relationship between scientists and the state work? And of equal importance to us here is just how exceptional were the relationships of state and scientists in the totalitarian states. And so we're going to compare democratic and totalitarian states. And on the basis of that comparison, we're going to ask again, did state science, state interference rather, hurt science? Right? What was the relationship between the state and the scientists in democratic states, Europe and America? Okay. So in that context, it's worth keeping one thing in mind, and that is that Friedrich and Brzezinski think that democratic science was free and that totalitarian science was unfree. That's the critical distinction. Okay. So what I want to do now is to look at all the research that's been done in the last decades to answer the questions that have just been posed and to update from the basis of Friedrich and Brzezinski the comparison of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union under Stalin and then to set them in their European context. Okay. So recent scholarship has agreed with Friedrich and Brzezinski on a great many points. So no one denies that the Nazi and Soviet states interfered in the work of scientists. There was a general agreement on that point. Now, I'll have to make available this handout that has the names of uh, a great uh, bunch of these uh, articles that I'll be referring to, uh, which I would normally write down on a board. But the first I want to refer to is Kirsty McCrackus, Surviving the Swastika Scientific Research uh, in uh, Nazi Germany. And then uh, one year after that, she wrote a book, uh, uh, an edited collection she uh, published with Mark Walker, W-A-L-K-E-R, uh, called Science, and Te Science, Technology and National Socialism. It's 1994. So I'm referring to the edited collection now. McCrackus and Renneberg <laughs> write about the expulsion of Jews from scientific institutes and the extension of party controls in the mid-1930s. So we're talking about the Gleichschaltung in Germany. Um, uh, just as an example of how the Nazi state was interfering in the work of scientists. And uh, Roy Medvedev, uh, Daniel Jaravsky, sorry, David Jaravsky, and Lauren Graham have written about the repression of bourgeois scientists uh, in the Soviet Union and the promotion of politically sound but otherwise ill-trained scientists in various fields in the Soviet Union. Um, and in particular, uh, it's uh, Jarowski who refers to and, and discusses at great length the case of Lysenko, that is, of someone who is politically sound and ill-trained. It's a fascinating example, uh, Lysenko. Um, but here, Basically, all of these authors that I mentioned uh, and that are in this uh, list that you should be looking for, uh, they have all discussed the tendency of, of uh, Nazi and Soviet states to promote particular fields over others and direct science to the aims of the state. Okay? So that's the point of agreement 
between the recent, the more recent uh, research and Friedrich and Brzezinski. But what have these authors said that Friedrich and Brzezinski didn't? Well, point number one. These authors, the more recent authors, the revisionists, if you will, have been struck by the extent to which Nazi and Soviet scientists willingly accepted state controls and the idea that the scientist should serve the state. That is, where Friedrich and Brzezinski emphasized control and manipulation from above, more recent scholarship has argued that there was considerable cooperation from below. Which is not to say that there was no resistance. So many, for example, German scientists were appalled to see the expulsion of their respected Jewish colleagues. Many were angered by political controls and by the suspension of foreign contacts. Many Soviet scientists attempted to halt the repression of their bourgeois colleagues and to resist the more egregious political controls. But there was also considerable support for what the Nazi and Soviet states were doing. In Germany, the views of scientists did not particularly differ from those of other ordinary Germans. So there were many who were suspicious of the Weimar order and its weaknesses. They associated uh, Weimar Germany with the humiliating Versailles peace and with national decline. And they wanted to see Germany, like other ordinary Germans, uh, restored to uh, national greatness. And these impressions were reinforced by the fact that the Weimar economic crises had hurt the state funding of scientific research and higher education generally. So that some of their enthusiasm for the Nazi regime came from the great increase in state funding for science. In short, there was no shortage of scientists who were enthusiastic about the regime and many who were willing to put up with what they thought were the unfortunate elements of Nazi policy. So what about the Soviet Union? As I mentioned before, the Soviet Union was a much less developed country than Germany. And it's remarkable how developed science was in the USSR given the backwardness of the country. But there was still very, very far to go. And the Soviets undertook to catch up to the West. This was one of their major goals. So, for example, in 1914, there were 23,000 teachers in the lands of, you know, in the Russian Empire, which becomes the, the USSR. So 23,000 teachers in 1914. In 1938, there were 1.3 million. Okay? So what is that? That's sort of uh, 50 times, more than 50 times. So from 23,000 teachers in 1914 to 1 1.3 million in 1938. And along with this vast increase in basic education, that is this achievement of universal literacy or near universal literacy, the Soviet government was training physicists, chemists, engineers, a whole range of uh, specialists. And by the time Stalin came to power in the late 1920s, there was a new generation of Soviet-trained scientists waiting in the wings. And in most cases, it was this young generation of scientists who demanded the purge of the old bourgeois scientists. They, and not the regime, initiated the repressions. They had been trained within the new order and they were enthusiastic about serving it. And it was quite to, to a considerable extent self-serving that they should want to remove the bourgeois specialists because indeed, of course, they would take their place. The scientists in uh, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were, uh, of course, pleased that they were treated with such respect. And in both countries, they enjoyed a relatively high standard of living. Um, 
And in the Soviet case, they were often given preferential access to rations. So, uh, briefly to summarize this first point then, where Friedrich and Brzezinski emphasize control from above, later scholarship also sees enthusiasm from below. That is, scientists had a choice, and many of them supported the regime. So, point number two then. Another contrast with Friedrich and Brzezinski concerns scientific freedom. So some recent research, for example, McCracus on Nazi Germany or Lauren Graham on the Soviet Union, has suggested that the interference of the state wasn't generally that harmful or that great. So. Uh, McCracken's study, for example, of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes, Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes, describes state interference in some considerable detail, including, for example, the Aryanization of the faculty and the appointment of Nazi Parsi officials to oversee their work. But she goes on to observe that the level of interference in scientific work was, with a few exceptions, insignificant. And similarly, Lauren Graham describes Soviet interference in the work of scientists and even the mass arrest of scientists in the late 1930s, but he goes on to observe that Soviet scientists continued to conduct fundamental research at the highest level. So uh, it might be worth observing here that research conducted by the physicists Tam, Frank, and Cherenkov, T-A-M-M, -M, Tam, Frank as in Frank, Cherenkov, C-H-E-R-E-N-K-O-V, their work at the height of the terror of 37 to 38 won the 1957 Nobel Prize. Another Soviet scientist by the name of Kurchatov, K-U-R, C-H-A-T-O-V, Kurchatov was busy designing particle accelerators and he discovered nuclear fission at approximately the same time. And curiously, there was even uh, enormously successful science being done within the gulag, within prison camps. So Soviet aviation, aviators, uh, aviation science made enormous progress with fighter design from within labor camps during the war. So state interference was nevertheless harmful. So the purging of Jewish scientists, the repression of bourgeois scientists uh, in the Soviet Union, the restriction of all foreign contacts set back the work of German and Soviet scientists uh, considerably. So there are lots of stories, too, of scientific disasters. And as I hinted earlier, in the history of Soviet science, one commonly told story is that of Trofim Lysenko, who was a much better politician than he was a scientist. And by means of clever and cruel political maneuvering, he came to control the field of Soviet biology in which he propounded all manner of ideologically couched scientific nonsense, which was an unmitigated disaster for the field. Now, in the Nazi case, historians point out that without the active participation of German scientists, the program of euthanasia, involuntary sterilization, attempts to build a master race, the mass extermination of the European Jews, Blitzkrieg, all of these sort of essential elements of the Nazi period would not have been possible without scientists, without their active participation. That is, the crimes of both these regimes would not have been possible without the active participation, without the enthusiasm of German and Russian scientists. Okay? And it's this last point that's important to keep in mind as we think about this final issue of this, uh, 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 of this lecture, which is uh, 
how did science in the democratic states differ from Nazi and Soviet scientists? How free was democratic science? What was the relationship between the state and the scientist in democratic Europe? Okay. Um, okay. So, science in democratic Europe. If we look back to the 19th century, we see that there uh, was generally, consistently, a close relationship between the state and the scientist. So through much of Europe, the state funded public education through uh, higher education, and it, it, or including rather higher education and scientific research. In France, state inspectors kept the right to approve all university courses and the state could hire and fire scientists if it didn't like their research. And this became actually worse in the early 19th century when the government consistently interfered in elections to the academy. So as in the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, the state paid for the work and funded the sorts of specialisms that they most needed. That is the engineers, the chemists, the biologists, and so on. The sort of skills that were required in a rapidly industrializing society. For the French government, involvement in science was driven by the sense that France needed to compete with Germany. When France had been beaten in the Franco-Prussian War in 1871, there was a common perception that science played an important role in technological, military and industrial might. And France needed to be ready for her revenge. And at the same time, there were many French scientists who shared this view. That is, they believed that the scientist had to be ready to serve the state and that national interest took precedence over free, independent, fundamental research. World War I strengthened the growth of, the, of state control over and interference in the work of scientists, as well as enthusiasm for that control among scientists. So Britain, France and other combatants mobilized physicists, mobilized chemists, medical researchers and others to the war effort on an unprecedented scale. And scientists were inspired by patriotic feelings to submit to state directives. Now, once victory had been achieved, many scientists were anxious to regain their independence, but by no means did they speak with a single voice. So in Britain, for example, scientists of left-wing political inclinations, so for example in the British Association of Scientific Workers, they looked to the Soviet experience and argued that scientists should be directly concerned with the great political struggles of the day. Practically speaking, that meant that they longed to help build socialism in Britain as Soviet scientists were building socialism in the USSR. Meanwhile, many French scientists looked to science in Nazi Germany as a model. So there was a science race, to use the arms race analogy, a science race ongoing, and the French envied the financial support that Nazi scientists received, believing that the high degree of state mobilization that was seen in Nazi Germany was needed for that science race to be won. And with that in mind, the French government took a strong role managing a scientific research strategy through what was called the Conseil Supérieur de la Recherche Scientifique. Excuse my uh, a lovely accent there which directly followed the Nazi model. In short, there was no shortage of scientists in democratic Europe 
who would have been pleased to follow the example of the totalitarian states. So to many, scientific freedom was a sort of self-indulgence and a denial of the contribution that they could make to society and to the nation. But what then of the crimes committed by Nazi and Soviet scientists under the direction of the totalitarian state? There was nothing uh, on the same scale, but there were some interesting uh, uh, and helpful parallels and helpful for us to learn and to think about. So as we'll see in one of the seminars, uh, the uh, Nazis or Nazi Germany was not the only country to, for example, undertake forced sterilization. The Americans, the Swedes, Brazilians, and others undertook forced sterilization as well. So racist eugenics was not limited to uh, Nazi Germany uh, either. Um, and one can also think about uh, uh, Joseph Mengele and the inhuman experiments on concentration camp inmates. Well, it should be observed that the Americans performed experiments on prison inmates with the same justification as Mengele in Nazi Germany. That is to say, military medical research was essential in the preparation for war. And many of the death camp doctors um, who uh, were tried at Nuremberg were acquitted because their defense attorneys pointed to the American parallels. So there are crimes being perpetrated that have very direct parallels uh, between democratic and totalitarian states. And it remains for you to read uh, further on these examples to compare and to contrast, to be asking again if there are any fundamental differences that would allow us to argue that totalitarianism, in this case, in, its, in the relationship between the state and the scientist, things about totalitarianism that are unprecedented and that are unique. Um, right, there is... Um, after the fact, yes, also, as it occurs to me, um, on the, the issue of this unfree science, this was another one of those parallels that are, are points that uh, Friedrich and Brzezinski emphasized. Um, and we talked about, uh, in contrast to what Friedrich and Brzezinski argued, uh, that uh, with the example of Tom Frank and Chirinkov and Kurchatov, that unfree science could be uh, successful. Um, there is the example of the Americans and uh, their own attempts to build a, uh, an atom bomb. Um, and it's worth observing that the, uh, the scientists at Los Alamos uh, were not free. That is to say, they were locked up and this was a concern about, about uh, secrecy and the, uh, the um, ideas not getting out to American enemies. So we have examples of unfree science there too that can be included in, in, um, in perils. And you'll see a, a discussion of these very things in the, the literature, in the, the longer uh, reading lists that come with the module. So let me simply draw a few uh, conclusions at this stage. In the course of this lecture, I did want you to see the great similarities between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in imposing strong state controls over the work of scientists. But I also wanted you to see that that state control was not something that scientists necessarily resented. In fact, the broader trend in Europe was towards state mobilization and the creation of an all-encompassing science policy. And that many scientists believed that this was both good and necessary.
The dark side of this trend was that many crimes committed by the Nazi state and by the Soviet state would not have been possible without the active participation of scientists. And to understand how they were incapable of, uh, or rather capable of such inhumanity, one shouldn't necessarily be investigating something that was peculiarly German or Nazi or Stalinist, but broader anti-liberal and anti-democratic trends in Europe and the Americas. And I'll leave it there. Next week.